Remain standing and please stand with me as we read the Gospel of John, chapter 10. <laughs> verily, verily, I say unto you, he that enters not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And they will not follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus spoke this parable unto them, but they did not understand what it was that he spoke unto them. Then Jesus said to them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. Whoever enters in by me shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy the sheep. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it in abundance. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Be seated. Surely this is the day that the Lord has made. We have come here to rejoice and be glad in it. My prayer is today that you would come with whatever burdens you bring, whatever fears you bring, whatever anxieties that you bring, and that you lay them down at the altar of God, that you can walk out of here knowing that God's is, God is in control, that everything is going to work out uh, by the power and grace and mercy of God. So I pray that you can go out of here just a little bit lighter than, than you come into this place. Probably one of the most... Uh, uh, prolific images that we have of Jesus is as a shepherd. Most, a, a lot of artwork over the centuries have been Jesus standing with a staff in the midst of a flock of sheep. Without a doubt, the 23rd Psalm is no doubt one of the most known and beloved and recited and memorized uh, poems uh, of, of the Psalms in, in our history. Some of the most famous artwork and just our, our culture is just is just saturated uh, with images of Jesus as the shepherd. In fact, the word Latin, the, the, actually the word uh, shepherd is pastor in Latin. Uh, the notion of pastoral care comes from the very idea of a shepherd leading his flock and caring for his flock and reaching out to that, to that, little, to that little sheep that gets in trouble. I, I am one of those little sheep uh, that get in trouble occasionally. There's two I am declarations in this text that I want you to take, take particular note of. And the first one's in verse 7 that says, I am the door. And we tend to want to just kind of bypass that one to get to, the, to, the, to what we would think is the good one. But I would argue that both of these are very valid and, and, uh, and most important to get the clear picture of who Jesus is where he says, I am the door. While we emphasize the shepherd function because it, it brings us great comfort to know that Jesus has got our back. That somehow that we, we get out of step, that Jesus is there with his grace and mercy. But the door function of the I am passage is just, is just as important. To have a full view of the understanding of who Jesus is, you've got to put those two together. Jesus says the good shepherd model without the door can really, can really lead to some, just the example of a charismatic leader, for instance, to raise up in the, midst of our, in the midst of our culture. And if you leave out the door part, you can really get in big trouble with that. I'm thinking of Jim Jones and David Koresh and, and other leaders that have, that have led people astray over the centuries. And then it becomes about the shepherds. There's, there's just that leader that comes up and, and leads us in some way. You, you won't go down that pride-filled road by recognizing Jesus as the door. If you see Jesus as the gateway, the passage, then it all becomes about who Jesus is. So you're able to put those two together, that it's through Him, Jesus is the way. So we're called to live into who Jesus is, not just, 
a charismatic leader of some, cor- of some sort. Jesus says the gate and the shepherd show us the very personal and the very personal nature of the relationship that God wants with each one of us. The gate and the shepherd have no meaning without the community of believers that's supporting and surrounding and engulfing who Jesus is. You understand our whole lives are to be focused and centered upon who Jesus is. Ultimately, that's the image of our community that's presented here. The community is identified. It's identified by people who call Jesus their shepherd, by people who call Jesus their Lord. And those who gather in that community, they come through the same gate, which is Jesus, that the very nature of Jesus is in who we are. But nowhere in this image are there other shepherds or there or their assistant shepherds. Our identity as a community comes because we come here as, 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 as a body of believers in one mind and in one accord because we all come through the gate, the gate of Jesus, and offer him and, 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 uh, and, and become allied with Jesus as our shepherd. I was, uh, I was thinking when I say that in one mind and one accord, I read an article uh, just the other day. I don't remember the pastor's name who read it but, he, it, but the title of his article was Pastoring in a 5-4 World. And I think we're, we're, we're living in a very deeply divided country right now. We're deeply divided. And it seems like that everything is 5-4. All of our Supreme Court decisions, they're 5-4. You understand, for every, for every you, might, you might win the case, but there's four people that are against it. So how do you pastor people in the midst of that? Well, well, you know, I would just share as we come together that when we keep our eyes focused on who Jesus is, when we keep our eyes focused on coming through the gate and the relationship that Jesus has with each one of us, I would say pastoring in a 5-4 world is no different than pastoring in any other world because our, 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 that's not our world. Our world is a community of grace, a community of faith, a community of peace where we come together in one mind and in one accord around who Jesus is and not who you are I say that's an amen so I say pastoring in a 5-4 world is no different than pastoring in any other world by coming through the gate that's what makes us the people of God that's what makes us a peculiar people we're not like the rest of the world we love people that hateful that, that are hateful and we love people that are that are spiteful to, or, toward us we love people that are unforgiving and unlovable that's who we're called to be. That makes us peculiar in the eyes of the world. The only, the only unity that we can ever have as human beings, that we can ever have, is that by tethering our lives to something that doesn't move, to an anchor, to an anchor of our souls that doesn't shake, rattle, and roll with the, with the palpitations of the world. Jesus is the anchor that holds. He's the rock of ages cleft for me. He's our house that's built on a rock that will weather the storms. He's the ship of Zion that weathers the storms of life and sails us toward home. Jesus is the rock that don't roll. He's our sustainer, our deliverer, our savior. And in him, we have victorious and abundant life. That'll preach, Rick. That'll preach all day long. But the question for us when we talk about abundant life, the question for us to consider today, are we living all of our lives? There's a big difference, trust me. Any doctor in here can tell you that there's a difference in living and being alive. There's a difference. Some people live a partial life instead of their whole life. Some people have things in their life that causes them to spit and sputter like a car that's, that has, ga- has o- a water in its gas. I remember back in 1975, my brother-in-law bought a brand new Cadillac, and it was a big old blue land yacht. Had the largest motor ever put in a stock car in, in the country's history. It was a 550 the motor alone was huge, but he didn't drive it very much. It had three or 4,000 miles on it, and in 1980, his mother died. 
And he came to me and said, Rick, I want you to drive the family to the cemetery, which is in Branchland. That's in Lincoln County. That's about a two-hour drive in a processional uh, in, in this big blue Cadillac. And there I go. He said, well, Rick, you better go test it. Well, I had to get jumper cables because he didn't drive the car. He sat out there until the battery was out. I got jumper cables. I got the car running and pulled out on Buffalo Creek Road. And there it go, just spitting and sputtering around. I couldn't get it to go anywhere. And finally, I got up on this big straight stretch, and I put my foot, I think those have carburetors. I put my foot in it, the carburetor. I jammed that thing to the floor, and that looked like an old Mally diesel engine for about a minute or so. The black smoke rolled out of the back of that car, and you know that car, after, after about a minute of blowing smoke, that car just purred right down, and you know I didn't have a bit of trouble out of it. I, you know what? We've got things in our lives that are that way, don't we? We, we get carbon built up, anxieties and fears in our lives that God never meant for us to carry around in our lives. We get that stuff built up in our lives, and it causes us to spit and sputter. It causes us not to be effective. It causes us to not have the life, an abundant life that Christ has for us. We wish we had somebody that just could come along and stick their foot in my carburetor sometime. Just to, just to get that junk blown out of our lives. Have a mechanic to come and clean up our lives. Clean the engine up. Restore it to full power. Understand a 550 engine has got a lot of power. Understand, Christian, you've been given tremendous authority, tremendous power to walk in the newness of life in this world in spite of all the junk that's going on you've been given a 550 motor and most of us are running around on a Volkswagen engine just barely puttering and sputtering along just trying to get from one day to the next and we've been given power and authority to walk in the newness of life in Jesus Christ remember where the gate is though you got to go through him remember who the shepherd is you got to look to him as your source of power Clean out the engine. Restore it to full power. For Christians, we call that the gift of salvation. That's what that means. All of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they use life and salvation synonymously. It's the same word in their book. Jesus has, has made it his business to give us abundant, full, free, victorious, liberating life. He has given that to us. I want to mention a few things that are particular problems that tend to, to rob us of our lives. First is self-centeredness. The whole, the whole universe revolves around you and your needs. You can always pay attention to that when people are talking how many times they use the pronoun I. That's always a red flag. In Greek mythology, Narcissus wanted to love someone. And he asked the Greek gods to give him love. So this, this Greek god placed a spell on Narcissus, and the first person you see, you'll fall in love with. And as he left, as he left where, he, where he was standing, he crossed a pond. And that pond was one of these real crystal clear ponds. He crossed on a bridge, and he looked over in that pond and saw himself. And he fell in love with himself. Narcissus wouldn't leave the bridge, and he died of starvation. We get our term narcissistic from that. When a person can't take their eyes off their self, you will die of starvation. Jesus is continually saying to you, he that finds his life will lose it, and if you lose it for my sake, you'll have life. He's continually telling us that in Christ's alphabet, the letter I is always, always placed second fiddle to you. Just look around you at your friends and family and notice who is the unhappiest, who is the most miserable people you know. You'll see their life is bound up by their self. Misery is close to the word miser. But the ones who are living life to its fullest, they're the ones who have listened to Christ. They've lost themselves in other people and other causes and especially in God and the kingdom of, of His Son, Jesus our Lord. They've lost themselves. They find themselves not looking inwardly, inwardly but always looking outwardly. The second major enemy in our lives is personal resentment. 
somebody wrongs you or steps on your toes, you resent it. You feel that justice demands that you get even. So you hold a grudge. Hatred is a thief that Jesus describes that comes to kill and destroy. How many times have I seen people carry grudges against other people that have been hurt in some way? But you know who hurts, who hurts the most in every situation? You do. It's said that a rattlesnake, if cornered, will sometimes be so upset that it will bite himself. You realize a, a rattlesnake can bite himself and die from a snake bite poison? S snake bite? Did you know that? I didn't know that. It looks like they're carrying that stuff around with them. It looks like they could drink it, don't it? But they can bite themselves and destroy themselves. That's exactly what harboring of hate and resentment is. It's biting yourself. It's hurting yourself. We think that we're harming others in holding these grudges, but we're doing deep, deep, in some cases, irreparable harm to ourselves. We dig our own grave with grudges. Jesus tells us to, to, to ask God to forgive us as we forgive those who have wronged us. How many times do you do that, preacher? Well, Jesus answered that too. Seemed to be no end of it. He said 70 times 7. Love your enemy, do enemies. Do, those, do good to those who hate us and pray for those who despitefully use you. Love is not a luxury, but a necessity of your salvation. I want you to do so. Let's close your eyes just for one second. Just one second. I want you to get in your mind somebody that you don't particularly like. <laughs> Maybe somebody that has done you wrong. I want you to realize with your eyes closed, I want you to know that you are called to love that person to the point that you would die for that one. Not your own child not your spouse or your mom or your dad, you're called to live such a life before them, that person that's on your mind right now, you're called to live a life before them that you're willing to die for that one. Amen. God, lead us. God, lead us. The third thing that steals our joy is fear and anxiety. 2 Timothy 1 says, 1 7 says that God does not give us the spirit of fear, but the spirit of love and power and a sound mind. Anxiety and fear will take everything from you. Do you know it will rob you of the peace for today? And it will rob you of your health. It will take away everything you have that steals your peace, destroys your efficiencies, takes away your health. Jesus talked about anxiety a lot. That's why he's always telling people, take no thought of tomorrow. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. In other words, today has enough trouble without you borrowing from tomorrow. Always worrying about what could or should. I call it scenarioizing. I don't think that's a word, but I, you know what I mean by that. Making up situations and then trying to figure out what may or may not happen. Do you know most of those never happen? About 99% of them never happen. And we worry and we fret and we're aggravated over it. Every day has trouble of its own. So let tomorrow's trouble be tomorrow's trouble and not today. We take away today's strength by worrying about tomorrow's trouble. Fear and anxiety does no good, but it causes you to, release, to, to lose a relationship with God. The cure for fear is faith. Faith that God has your back. Faith that everything is going to work out according to God's riches and God's plan. Self-centeredness, resentment, anxiety, and lastly, guilt. Guilt will cause you to, loot, to leave God. Your conscience will give you direction if you're being led by the Holy Spirit. Listen to your conscience. Listen to the Holy Spirit. When you go against that which you know to be right, you know you pay with guilt. Guilt will literally make you sick. And we are free from those things, including guilt. Fear. Have faith that trusts. And resentment, love that forgives. Self-centeredness, look to others. And guilt. We have a pardon from God. 
Rejoice in that, church, that we've been pardoned for that which we've done. As Jesus spoke to the paralytic on the couch, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Well, you know, I can proclaim that from this pulpit this morning. Church, thy sins are forgiven thee. Rejoice. Be no longer beleaguered by those, by those sin and the sin and the guilt, the resentment, the grudges, and all those things that rob you of peace and joy. Turn that big 550 motor loose that God has given us. Jesus has given us the gate himself. He has given us the shepherd himself that we may live a life in abundance and victory. Jesus has given us a unifying spirit of love that we may love each other and live with each other in community, even in a mixed-up world, that we may live all of our life. You hear that? That we may live all of our life in the abundance of grace and mercy and peace. To God be the glory. Great things God has done. And I pray that if there's any person under my voice this morning that has resentment, that has, that's holding a grudge, that's self-centeredness, and they know it, and there's guilt that's, that's belaboring them, I pray that you hear and experience the salvation and the forgiveness that only Jesus can give you as you walk through the gate and live by the shepherd. You will know peace that passes all understanding. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen.